man lives a little later on. Regardless of warnings, the future doesn't scare me. I started out watching High Guardian Spice with the intention of just covering it in a single video and then moving on to other topics. However, it soon became apparent there was far too much to discuss and I split the video into smaller chunks. And even after doing this, the final video ended up meeting the requirements to be classified as a feature film. And yet, I am still reading comments on the videos and messages in my live chat pointing out even more things about this show that don't make sense, were badly handled, questions that were raised and never answered, botched character handling and just outright mistakes. The level of broken displayed by this show as a product coming out of a professional studio meant to be comparable to its peers is beyond staggering. To the point I couldn't even end the last video with a brief final thoughts wrap up without tacking on at least another hour to this debacle. And debacle truly is the word for it. In absolutely every way. A fiasco if you will. An absolute shit show. And that is not even considering the real world funk this show will forever have wafting around it. But I think what makes High Guardian Spice so anger inducing as a show removed from its meta context is the fact that there was potential here. The very basics of this show's idea could very easily have worked and the very brief flashes of entertainment and good ideas only further illustrate how infuriating its incompetence is. This isn't the case of a terrible show with a terrible premise and terrible writing and terrible characters ending up being terrible. If it were, there'd be far less to say about it. It's not the result of non-writers and non-animators making their first backyard show, or an assembly line product constructed by committee without any care or heart put into it. It is a cautionary tale of what happens when you write unabashedly from self-indulgence and entitlement in an echo chamber coupled with studio interference and a failure of management. So let's start the same way the show creators did and focus on characters first before we focus on any of the world building. Rosemary doesn't have any real character. She is supposedly the lead of the story, but she is lacking in the very basics that any character needs, let alone the protagonist. She has absolutely no motivation. She joins the Guardian Academy to become a Guardian, but she at no point elaborates on why she wants to become a Guardian. This is exacerbated by the fact both we, the audience, as well as Rose herself don't know what a Guardian is, nor do we ever find out, nor is that question ever used within the plot at any point. The only reason Rose is at the Guardian Academy is because the writers of the show have their main setting be the four girls at the Academy. And so they take the reasons for them being at the Academy for granted. Of course our main characters are at the Academy. That's what the show is about. What do you mean why? All that's left is for the audience to fill in the broken narrative on behalf of the writers by guessing that the reason Rose is at the Academy is tied to her wanting to be like her mother. And in a weird and frustrating feedback loop, the show is aware that its audience, which it arrogantly assumes is automatically going to be genre savvy, will simply make up its own mind as to why our main character is at the main setting based on other shows it assumes the audience is familiar with. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. This reliance on the audience being aware of other like-minded properties is a big problem with this show. But what makes Rose even more baffling as a main character is the fact that the other three girls all do have motivations and goals. Rose, the main character, is the only one of the group who seems to be there for no real reason, leaving her aimless and with no end goal to work towards or fail at. She exists as purely reactionary to the things that happen to her, and although having a main character as reactionary is a valid story, Usually the reactionary character has some emotional response as to what is happening to them, rather than just mindlessly weathering every situation without any of it affecting them. Rose is also shown to be a rather poor student as far as studies go. The show also can't make up its mind if Rose is supposed to be a capable warrior or not. She flip-flops between being quirkily clumsy and unintentionally destructive to being competent and unusually capable as a warrior, depending on which episode you're watching, with no indication that this is character growth or applied effort. It merely happens out of convenience for the current situation. 
So she is an aimless character with no motivations at a school where she is not good at schoolwork and her status as a warrior flip-flops between being good or being bad based on what situation the writers want her to be in. I keep making the joke that every single time Rose talks about her mom, she has to remind us that she's sad about it. But the reason I kept saying it in this exact same way was not only because of the comedy of how often it happens, but because the simple phrase, Rose reminds us her mom is missing and she's sad about it, is the exact level of depth and relevance it is given every single time. There is no point to Rose reminding us about her sadness other than to remind us of her sadness. It's never developed into feelings beyond, this makes me sad. You can't even call it grief, because grief itself is a complex experience with various behaviors and emotions tied to it, none of which Rose ever displays. I will repeat what my friends said here as I did in an earlier video, that Rose's constant reminder of her mom and her sadness is a band-aid to try and fix her lack of personality. At some point, the writers were aware that Rose has nothing else to her character other than being the energetic, dim-witted, optimistic protagonist we've seen in every single shonen ever. However, for reasons I can only speculate on, they didn't try and rework her character into a more robust, well-rounded personality. Instead, they tried to tack on the illusion of deeper and complex emotions, which only ever show up in the very specific situations in which it's relevant, more to remind the audience that Rose supposedly has more going on than she actually does. At the fall festival, she suddenly starts talking about how this is a time where she and Sage can just be kids and not worry about guardian duties and adult matters. But she only says this because the concept of a character struggling with the coming of age narrative might say that in this situation. However, nothing else at any point of the show ever shows Rose going through a coming of age arc, nor is she ever shown to have her childish personality be a problem which she also is never truly allowed to grow out of. She merely says this line of being allowed to be a kid because the concept of this episode was Rose and Sage having a falling out due to clashing personalities. However, since Rose's personality has not changed in any way since episode 1, it doesn't have a good foundation as to why their personalities would clash now when they never had before despite being childhood friends. And so, with no building blocks to work with, they have Rose become a completely different person for this one moment of conflict with Sage. And as soon as the scene is done, not even the episode as a whole, just the scene, this opportunity to act like a child without the worry of responsibilities is never brought up again. I've tried to give possible reasons in the earlier parts as to why she's so broken in terms of writing. However, I want to stay clear of trying to apply theories and speculations in this final part because I worry what I say might be taken as a solid fact rather than me desperately searching for meaning as to why the writing is like this. Why Rose is giving nothing but the most surface level of tropes and stereotypes while also being denied any character growth could be for many reasons. Being an author insert, conflicting ideas between the writers, Rodriguez being overly attached to her and unwilling to have her personality change, pure neglect from the writers, simple pure incompetence. There are an endless amount of reasons as to why she's like this. And any one of those reasons sound possible. But the truth is, I don't know why she ended up this way. And the real answer may be none of those things, or all of those things, or a possible different reason nobody has considered yet. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter as to why, because apart from being an explanation as to how we got here, it doesn't fix the problem that Rose is a hollow shell of a character who we are meant to follow as the show's main focus. Sage is my least favorite character in the show, but although she is badly written, Unlike Rose, Sage has a large amount of detail and complex behaviors. The problem is that the character she's supposed to be and the character she is written as are two completely different people. The term gaslighting has become rather eroded from its actual meaning as it's currently a fad word. However, a lot of people will accuse someone of gaslighting when the person they're accusing is simply lying or disagreeing with them. Gaslighting comes from the movie and play called, well, Gaslight in which a newly married woman is slowly and systematically broken down psychologically by her husband through various methods of manipulation to make her doubt her own sanity. One of the ways he does this is to incrementally turn down the gas lights in their home by just enough for the wife to notice but unable to be completely sure it's really happening. 
all while her husband insists that there is no change and so her perception of the truth is incorrect. Gaslighting at its core is not only breaking someone down until they feel like they're going crazy, but in the act of doing so, making the victim believe that they are doing something wrong for implying the abuser is the one lying. It's the Una Reverse card of mental abuse. In High Guardian Spice, Sage is written as a terrible person, and she's written as a terrible person very well. If she was portrayed as a slow burn villain by the end of the season, she probably would be my favorite character for how insidious her portrayal is. Throughout several points in the show as a whole, Sage has shown to have very little empathy for other people's feelings, both positive and negative. She makes an active effort to never be happy because it detracts from her getting to play up the anxiety-ridden victim role. She simply acts miserable for long enough until someone asks her what's wrong so she can talk about her problems. She shows an alarming level of controlling behavior towards Rosemary. When Rose shows interest in someone other than Sage, Sage spends every second complaining about how Rose is doing something stupid and wrong until Rose runs back to her side. She is horrifically sexist directly to another person's face while behaving as if what she's saying is just basic fact everyone with common sense knows is true. When the people around her don't want to fall in line with what Sage wants, she loses her temper. But when having her logic questioned, she resorts to crying to emotionally manipulate them and turn them into the aggressor. And then later makes hyperbolic claims about how the people who wouldn't submit to her once have made some slight against her, forcing them to apologize to her. Despite demanding to be beside her constantly, when Rose shows any desire or interest in doing something removed from Sage's wants, Sage verbally assaults her and, after doing so, continues to withhold affection or even just common decency of acknowledgement until Rose apologizes to her for being her own person, at which point Sage apologizes for yelling but justifies her actions by blaming her anxiety, using her mental health as a shield. She constantly and repeatedly shows herself to be extremely controlling over other people, prone to manipulation tactics and emotional abuse, disregards the emotions of others and shrugs off horrible acts after she's placated of any responsibility for what went wrong. And all this would be extremely interesting and amazing writing for a villain, but the show gaslights its audience by continuously repetitively, insistently presenting Sage as a good person who we should like. Sage's actions and everything she says and does makes us experience her as awful, but the show pretends like none of these things are bad or, if they are, then they're not Sage's fault. Watching Sage genuinely makes you feel like you're going crazy, because any person with even a shred of emotional awareness can see at least some of the horrible things she does throughout the show. But the show itself behaves like the opposite is happening and Sage is being sympathetic, that what she's doing wasn't that bad, or at worst, that Sage is in the right. Oh, you're the kindest man in the world. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In a show with straw man homophobes, straw men who assert traditional gender roles, edgelord murderers, and a teacher constantly on the verge of murdering her students, Sage is the worst and most hateful character in the entire series, and the show insists that she is lovable and relatable. Parsley is one of the more likable characters and probably the best of the main four girls. Her personality is positive and upbeat. She's extremely nice to everyone without the overbearing energy of similar positive characters like, say, Pinkie Pie. She's also rescued from being a one-dimensional inspirational Instagram quote by giving her grounded and relatable problems in the form of her family. Rather than going for the obvious disapproving, unsupportive authority figures trying to pressure their daughter into a lifestyle they approve of, Parsley's relationship with her parents is strangely nuanced for this show. She loves her parents dearly and they love her back, but she comes with a typical problem faced by eldest children in large families in that she's expected to put her own life on hold already at the age of 14 to help raise her siblings, stopping her from pursuing her own goals and desires and in a larger sense, robbing her the freedom to discover who she is as her own person. 
At the same time, her status as the mom friend and her kindness and patience with others is directly influenced by being the eldest sibling in a large family. The problem is, these are all characteristics raised in episode 4 and then resolved in episode 4. Episode 4 ends with Parsley essentially completing her main conflict. At the end of the episode, her parents concede that she should be allowed to pursue her passion, while Parsley acknowledges she can help out at home on the weekend, while also attending the academy, and this conflict is resolved. And then, the writers didn't know what to do with her afterwards. As the show goes on from this point, Parsley fades more and more into the background, to the point of completely getting removed for almost the entirety of episode 9 when most of the plot starts happening. She gets some minor focus in episode 6 during the obstacle course with Parnell, but even there she is used as the C plot, sprinkled in between Rose thirsting off the Aster and Sade complaining about it, which gets the majority of the focus. Breaking Aster's foot is her most notable moment in that episode, and it's only notable because it's very out of character for her. On top of this, Parsley's reasons for going to the academy also make little to no sense. She's going to the academy essentially to become a blacksmith, which is something she already was, at her family business. The business of blacksmithing. And no, her parents' issue is actually not with Parsley's desire to becoming a blacksmith, as they more or less expect her to help with the family business of blacksmithing, while she wants to instead go to the High Guardian Academy to become a blacksmith. So she and her parents argue about this. Parsley's character has no strong foundation as she has no reason to be at the academy specifically other than it's the main setting where the writers wanted the show to take place. But with an extremely flimsy motivation to be here in the first place, pursuing a path she was already on before the academy, and is shown at the academy as already being good at blacksmithing, and her main conflict with her parents resolved, there is nothing else the writers could do with her. And since there is no more time in the show to focus on her as a character since her screen time was sacrificed in favor of Snapdragon's shift into being a main focus, a decision roughly made around episode 6, Parsley becomes less of a character than Amaryllis. Parsley is eventually discarded by the writers by the end of the show as they lost interest in her for shinier and more aggrandizing characters. A sad fate for what was actually their best written protagonist. Time has the potential to be a good character, but due to her specifically being written as a closed-off antagonistic stoic character for the majority of the early episodes, we never really get to know her as a person outside of her angst about the main plot, which the show also decides to neglect. And because time's personality, goals, conflicts and inner turmoil are so closely connected by the rot and the fairy woods and trying to find a cure, the show's complete disinterest in developing the story means time herself is neglected as well. Apparently the goal was to write her as a tsundere character, but in reality she comes across more as Sailor Morris from the manga and the live action Sailor Moon show. She starts off antagonistic and hostile towards the main group. The only character that seems to thaw her is Parsley due to her patient and kind-hearted nature. But we never actually see this develop slowly and naturally. It starts off slowly in the earliest episodes, but as the show loses interest in showing Parsley, we stop seeing Parsley develop her friendship with Time and integrate her into the friend group. Instead, in episode 7, during the tonally broken out of place truth or dare game, Time just recites her backstory to the main characters who give her a hug and she's now part of the friend group moving forward. Time is a victim of the show's disinterest, a collection of ideas and concepts brought up but never delivered on. Her driving force of the rot is never focused on to any large degree, so we only see her involved with it off screen while we're listening to Sage whine about her nonsensical problems involving the magic system. Her relationship with her mom is shown as being rocky, but is never resolved or developed past the point of establishment. She's at the academy, but whether she's there by choice to find a cure or if she's there against her will to keep her out of trouble changes depending on the episode. Her character potential rears its head now and then when she makes a statement that's overly dramatic and angsty, making her look like the overly serious dork she truly is at heart. But these moments are so few and far between, we can't even call it a personality trait. 
The only other time she's allowed to have her personality removed from the rot is when the writers want to ship her with one of the mermaids, which incidentally is also never mentioned again. Time is the opposite of Parsley. Rather than giving her a conflict and resolving it in a single episode, time is merely the concept of a character, who is also then discarded as the show loses interest in the main story. I'm not going to spend too much time here since I have given Amaryllis her praises in the previous videos. Amaryllis is probably the only character in the entire show that managed to grow and develop organically as the episodes went on, changing from a stereotypical mean girl into a stereotypical mean girl who also happens to be fiercely loyal to the handful of people she decides she cares about. The only thing worth mentioning that I didn't before is that Amaryllis is unironically a better leader than Rosemary is, being both supportive of her friends, quick to piece information together and good at taking charge and wrangling people into order when the time calls for it. I am convinced that Amaryllis started the show as nothing more than a stereotypical bully that was never supposed to get much more character than that. But as the story developed, the writers actually started to like her and as a result gave her more to do. A lot of that also has to do with the frankly amazing voice acting from Katie McVeigh. Ironic that she's universally accepted as the best thing in the show when she started out as someone we were supposed to dislike. I'm about to say something that will probably get me at least one angry essay in the comments, but hear me out. Snapdragon being trans weakens her character. Hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. The problem is not that the show has a trans character. The problem is that once Snapdragon is revealed in no uncertain terms as being a trans girl, all her personality up until this point is replaced by being trans. At the 2018 Crunchyroll Expo, Snapdragon's character was described as, quote, a pretty boy, a hottie, an angsty boy, a representation for all angsty boys out there, which I assume was a joke because they kept talking about representation at this panel, and that his only friend is Amaryllis. They also mentioned at the same panel that they had completed dialogue recording up until episode 6 at this time, meaning they could still change things after episode 6 as they hadn't recorded anything yet. At the start of the show, Snapdragon is shown very much within these parameters, and like I mentioned, I still find Snapdragon to be one of the best written teenagers in a cartoon. She most accurately captures that, ugh, whatever mom, attitude, perpetually over everything and everyone around her. This is further developed when we see her almost immediately crush on Sage after Sage yells at her and Amaryllis. Incidentally, this is almost definitely by accident, but it's interesting how Snapdragon is continuously drawn to aggressive women. This could almost be a personality trait if the writers actually picked up on it. Snapdragon is also shown to be in her head a lot. She was described at the panel as being angsty, so even in the earliest episodes of the show, you get the impression that she's definitely angsting over something that's bothering her. When she's teamed up with Sage, the girl she has a crush on, she becomes extremely upset after Sage tells her to her face that boys don't have the same emotions as girls, or that their feelings aren't valid because of their sex slash gender. Snapdragon struggles with living up to her father's legacy, being reluctant to switch from the heavy axe to the rapier despite the rapier fitting her better in what was actually a far better nuanced hint at Snapdragon being trans than the actual episode where Snapdragon has a flashback to her father. And then around episode 8, the concept of Snapdragon being trans is brought up in a more straightforward and on the nose way. A plotline they follow throughout the remaining episodes and spend the vast majority of time on when they're not focusing on Sage being awful and Rose's competency changing every episode. And suddenly, everything that comes after this episode and everything that came before this episode turns into Snapdragon is trans. Why was Snapdragon so angsty and broody at the beginning of the show? Because she's trans. Why did Snapdragon not have any friends outside of Amaryllis and why was she so closed off towards others? Because she's trans. Why did Snapdragon have a difficult relationship with her father? Because she's trans. And my absolute favorite, why did Snapdragon start to cry when Sage told her boys don't create emotional bonds as strongly as girls do? 
because Snapdragon is trans. In the video discussing this moment, I said that... Don't, don't worry, worry, it gets, it gets worse. worse. It, it gets it so much worse. worse. That is because in hindsight, it turns out Snapdragon is not upset that Sage is telling her she doesn't form friendships on the same emotional level as girls do. Snapdragon is upset because Sage is insisting that Snapdragon is a boy, causing Snapdragon to get very upset because she's struggling with gender dysphoria. And that, I'm a girl, you couldn't possibly understand. Girls and guys and guys and girls and girls and... <sighs> In other words, the show is not criticizing Sage for saying men don't form emotional bonds. The show is criticizing Sage for implying that Snapdragon is a boy. And in doing so, it actually reinforces Sage's toxic masculinity. Because it turns out later that Snapdragon isn't a boy, she's a girl. So when Sage said boys don't understand emotional bonds the same way girls do, she's right. Boys don't form emotional bonds as strongly as girls do, which is why Snapdragon isn't a boy. Because she forms strong emotional bonds just like girls do, because she is a girl. And so, by making Snapdragon trans, they boil down every single personality trait, every single inner conflict, every single argument, every single conversation, every single interaction, every single moment that Snapdragon has ever been on screen as trans. Snapdragon now doesn't have a personality outside of being trans, and her trans personality does not have anything more than textbook cliches of being a trans person. She's uncomfortable with who she is, so she's angsty. She is in a conflict over her parents and what they expect her to be like. She doesn't want broad shoulders or grow facial hair, neither of which are things that she has. She wants to dress in feminine clothing. What the fuck? Mom, how do I be out here looking this fucking fly? Have you seen me right now? What the fuck? It's all just so basic and surface level. And once the plot point of Snapdragon being trans is introduced, you realize there's nothing deeper going on there, nor was there ever. The show doesn't seem to know what it wants to be as a piece of LGBTQ media. It tries to both be a portrayal of utopian queerness where everyone can marry anyone, people can be openly trans, girls can fall in love with girls, and everything is open and accepted. But it also seems unable to tell the story about the trans experience without including examples of transphobia. It only knows how to write a trans character in the narrative of the eternal victim, because the show seems unable to think of a trans coming of age story without making it about hatred and persecution. And so they end up breaking their own established world building by introducing straw man characters to be hateful and transphobic. Because they need the transphobia to reinforce Snapdragon's trans identity. See, here's the thing. A person's identity is a crucial integral part of themselves that shapes their life, their relationships, their future and their experiences. But trans is not a personality type. In the 90s and early 2000s, when gay characters were finally allowed to be shown on TV and movies more openly, it was important to show gay people in a positive light. So at the time, all gay men had the exact same funny, entertaining, witty personality. That personality being gay. See, this is the color I want. This is Damien. He's almost too gay to function. Beret, a pot of beret, and souffle. I'm gay! <laughs> I'm super! Thanks for asking. Are you trying to ruin me? Don't look at me. I'm hideous. They all sounded the same, they all acted the same, they all spoke the same, they all listened to the same music, they enjoyed shopping and girl talk. They were completely interchangeable. Because at this point in media, gay was a personality type. And the only kind of gay that was not this personality type was the other gay personality type, which was dying tragically from AIDS. Now, there were outliers, I do know this, but in the broad TV and movie atmosphere of this time period, if you were gay, this was how you were portrayed. And don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing gay culture as it exists in the real world and the people in the community who are reflected accurately in flamboyant characters. I'm criticizing the fact that for a long time, this was the only personality a gay character on screen had. I'm criticizing the lack of diversity, not the behavior. What gay stuff do you like like? Um, I'm into comics. Like Kathy Griffin? She's hilarious. Uh, no, like comic books. That's not gay. That's just lame. 
Snapdragon's character is written with the same shallowness. Snapdragon is trance. That is her only personality. That is who she is. That is all who she is. And the writers are so self-congratulatory about having a trans character that that is the only thing Snapdragon will ever be allowed to be. Having trans representation in a positive light told from trans creators is great. I just wish Snapdragon could be given a character to go along with it. You're all I ever wanted. You're trans. Thank you. But what else? What else? Is being trans. All that matters to you? Derek? What else? I... uh... uh what else is there? I'm just gonna lump everyone else together here because none of them are interesting enough to give more attention to. Caraway has no character beyond being the ambiguously wise teacher who sometimes relays information about magic when he's not relaying information about being trance. He has no personality outside of this apart from one brief mention of hanging out with Sage's cousins in a joke not even Rodriguez appears to understand. Sage's cousins, Allo and Anise, are a lesbian couple who are married. Other than that, they have no real personality either, other than being the older sister types to Sage and Rosemary and being in love. Olive is introduced from her very first scene as eventually getting a redemption arc, so most of the time we're just watching her being a generic villain until she stabs Mandrake. She doesn't have a personality outside of this. She taunts the gang, she sulks in the attic, sometimes she does cat things. Redbud is only one joke that would have been relatively amusing if we only saw her once, but due to the fact that none of the other teachers have any personalities at all apart from being ambiguously wise, she ends up getting the most attention out of the faculty, which is annoying when she seems to only exist to murder her students for no good reason other than it's supposed to be funny. Mandrake is a murder-happy edgelord. None of the other characters do anything worthy of talking about. Parnell and Slime Boy are there too, I guess. And that's it for the characters. A broken collection of loose ideas and concepts that mostly come across as the writer starting a thought and losing interest halfway through, leaving loose threads and unresolved stories in their wake, or simply never even caring to create anything in the first place. I'm not going to spend too much time here because I genuinely get overwhelmed by the magnitude of broken world building in this show. I have gone on an extensive period of time in these videos trying to explain all the many ways in which the magic system doesn't work and I highly recommend going back and reading the comments on those videos as it seems like every single person who brings up the magic system mentions at least three new ways in which it makes no sense. In that 2018 panel, the writers described it with the nature of magic in this show is quite dynamic. It is a driving force of the story. This is the only mention the writers gave the magic system in this panel, and it appears they never developed it beyond this concept that magic is important to the plot, without ever actually getting to the point of writing the plot. Also, using the word dynamic is just a buzzword for the fact that they had no solid concept of what the magic in the show is like, and it'll just change to whatever they wanted to as they go along. Take a look at this guy. Go ahead, take a good long look. You see, they just didn't care. The crew cited their major inspirations for High Guardian Spice as older magical girl shows, specifically mentioning Sailor Moon, Tokyo Mew Mew, and Magic Knight Ray Earth. Rodriguez even mentions modeling Rosemary's personality off of Hikaru's, which makes a lot of sense in hindsight. However, I don't think the crew actually, um, watched those shows? I mean, obviously they watched them, but exactly what part of those shows did they get their inspiration from? Sailor Moon is the OG Magical Girl as Hero anime, but apart from having a mostly female cast and Ikuhara cramming as much queerness as he could into every single inch of this show, it feels like the only parts of Sailor Moon the creators wanted to be inspired by was the surface level. Sailor Moon is about an ancient evil from thousands of years ago returning to do great damage to the innocent people of Earth, and Sailor Moon is the only person who can defend the place she calls home and slowly learns about her deeper purpose, both as a reincarnation of the Moon Princess as well as a paragon of love as a healing force. 
The plot of Sailor Moon is one of self-growth and discovery, completely intertwined with fighting an ancient evil to protect the world and the people you love. You can't separate those two things in the narrative. Tokyo Mew Mew is likewise about an alien threat to the planet Earth, and the main characters being directly given powers and abilities associated with some of Earth's endangered species. The plot is once again about the Earth being in danger from a direct and obvious threat, and our main characters needing to protect their home. In Magic Knight Ray Earth, three girls get isekai into a fantasy world to save its princess from the High Priest who has imprisoned her. Magic Knight Ray Earth is also unique as our main girls are both magic users who each wield a specific element, but they also carry swords, wear armor, and sometimes pilot mechs. Because why have one awesome thing when you can have all the awesome things? But see what all these shows have? A main plot. Sailor Moon needs to find the Moon Princess and defeat Queen Beryl. Ichigo needs to defeat the alien invasion. The Magic Knight girls need to rescue a princess. Now, what is the plot of High God in Spice? Not who the characters are, not what their relationship and friendship is, not like the whole f pitch. What is the plot? of High Guardian Spice. Four girls go to the High Guardian Academy to become guardians. There is an evil force called the Rot that appears to be killing trees in a forest somewhere. There is a place called Witch Country which seems involved somehow. High Guardian Spice was inspired by these magical girl shows but only because these shows had girls use magic and fight bad guys and be in friend groups. Nothing about these shows' actual narrative seemed to have played any part in the supposed inspiration. The one I think might have been the biggest inspiration was probably Magic Knight Ray Earth, as it's the only one of the three that takes place in a fantasy world. But because the three main characters in Ray Earth are from contemporary Tokyo, the world of Sefiro is one they slowly learn more about as they travel through it slowly becoming more familiar with this world as a location and we the audience learn along with them. But High Guardian Spice has no interest in building a physical world for us and the characters to explore. It's only interested in its world as a backdrop to put the characters into so they can interact with each other in quirky ways. In my opinion, the place this show should have drawn its inspiration from instead are shows like Ranma and a Half or Urusai Yatsura. Shows that are largely comedic in nature, focusing on their large cast, interacting with each other either comedically or dramatically depending on the tone of the episode, as they weather singular episodic situations, sometimes mundane and sometimes fantastical, as the show hinges its main focus on playing around with the will they won't their romance of the main characters, which is a dynamic that also permanently keeps them in the early falling in love stages of a relationship. High Guardian Spice is clearly only really interested in shipping its characters and queer representation. So why even bother trying to write a large overarching plot if you're not interested in one? It feels like the only reason High Guardian Spice has a larger plot is out of obligation. Either because it feels it has to have a large overarching plot because that's what it's supposed to have based on its inspirations and its contemporaries, or because it was some kind of mandate by Crunchyroll who wanted to really sell this idea that Crunchyroll was going to invest its profits in creating original media rather than pay licensing fees for anime. But whatever the reasons behind this decision, I think it was a wrong move. Urusai Yatsura also had the world sometimes needing saving, but Urusai Yatsura knew that whatever silly nonsense it had going on, at the end of the day, what it was about was whether Lamu and Ataru would ever romantically end up together. Ranma and Ahof knew that it was about whether Ranma and Akane would become a couple, or if Shampoo would get in between them, or one of the other 50 ships happening in this show. And whatever other narratives it decided to introduce would only be there briefly, because the plot was never the main focus. High Guardian Spice is a ship-focused dramedy forced into the role of an epic high fantasy about saving the world, without ever developing the world that needs saving or what it needs saving from. At some point while doing something else online, I came across this post, and I didn't really have a way to organically add it to this section, so much like this show, I'm just gonna tack it on here at the end for you to read on your own.
Who was this show actually for? I mentioned the bizarre tonal disaster that was episode 7 and it's true that after this episode the show seemed to decide it wanted a more mature atmosphere. But unlike other shows which might start lighthearted and slowly become darker as the plot happens, High Guardian Spice comes across as not knowing if it wanted to be for kids or an older audience. The rumor is that Crunchyroll mandated that High Guardian Spice aim for an older audience halfway through production, and I can believe it, as the mature elements introduced such as violence and swearing feel tacked on and like a last minute addition. But it confused the show more than it already was in who it wanted its audience to be. The show feels like it was made for children, but the violence and swearing obviously negates that. So maybe this show was made for a queer audience, which I think was probably the only real target audience the writers had in mind. But if the show was aimed at the queer audience and the Crunchyroll mandate made it specifically an older queer audience, then why does the show feel the need to waste large sections of its time explaining to the older queer audience what being queer is? The sections of the show where Carraway explains what being trans is feels like it's explaining the concept of transsexuality to an audience that isn't familiar with it. But if its target audience are exactly the people most likely to already know what being trans is, why waste so much time explaining it? You can have trans representation without reading the dictionary definition out loud. So who is this explanation for? The queer audience that already knows all of this? Or the audience who might not know what being trans is but who the show obviously has no interest in catering to? The only answer I'm left with is that this explanation of what being trans is only exists here so that the show can self-aggrandize itself to a queer audience with no end goal other than to be praised for existing. It's not interested in these lectures actually teaching anyone anything. It's here for trans people to give it automatic adoration and praise with no effort on its own part. As for the mature warning at the beginning of each episode, I want to make it clear that what I'm about to say is nothing but pure speculation from me and I have no solid evidence to support it. But I am confident enough in my guess to say it out loud. People on various social medias grumbled that they think the only reason this mature warning is at the start of every episode is because this show openly has LGBTQ characters in it and that it's some sort of microaggression or thinly veiled homophobia because there is nothing else in the show that would warrant a mature warning. However, I'm sorry to say I can only see this as almost like a learned victimhood on their part. Because none of the other anime hosted on Crunchyroll that feature prominently LGBTQ characters and themes have this maturity warning. Zombieland Saga has a trans character in the main cast who has an entire episode about her experience as a trans girl and it has no maturity warning at any point in the show's run. Yuri on Ice has no maturity warning. Wandering Sun, an entire fucking anime about a trans girl coming to terms with her gender, does not have a mature warning. On top of this, Crunchyroll actually has multiple articles on its own site specifically talking about and recommending anime with trans and queer characters in it. This warning is not some veiled mark of oppression against the queer community because at no point does Crunchyroll warn people against queer content in any other show. As for violence, not even Chainsaw Man has a mature warning at the start so I highly doubt the lackluster blood and High Guardian Spice would get some kind of deterrent warning people against it. So why does it have this mature warning? My guess is when Crunchyroll decided to market their new Crunchyroll Originals program by showcasing High Guardian Spice before it had any animation to show and used virtue signaling as a selling point, focusing on the creators being either women or queer or both, they were taken aback by how vocally angry its user base was about this. However, the main complaint by the Crunchyroll user base was, in short, why are you using our subscription money to fund your own shows when we pay for anime? And why are you trying to justify it with wokeness as a shield when we are not happy with our money getting used for this? But of course, investing in original content was a business decision the higher ups in the company had already made and put into motion. And when a big company has made a business decision of this nature, no amount of consumer complaints will be blamed on the exact business decision they are complaining about. 
there will always be some extensional thing about the business decision that they can blame instead, rather than the decision itself. The princess and the frog didn't make as much money as we expected. It couldn't be because the story was lukewarm, the characters were pretty flat, and our first black princess spends most of her runtime as a frog. No, it must be because people just don't like 2D movies anymore. We gave it a shot, but the free market has spoken. Back to CG it is. Dead Space 3 didn't make as many sales as we wanted. It couldn't be because we tried to make a horror game into an action game, forced important story moments to be co-op only, and it's completely littered with microtransactions. It must be because people just don't like horror games anymore. Time to kill another studio! And so, Crunchyroll's user base told them very loudly that they didn't like Crunchyroll spending their subscription money on an original product and justifying it so smugly by touting how progressive they were for it. And Crunchyroll decided that people don't want shows with queer representation in it. So when this show that everybody already hates finally came out, a show which Crunchyroll by now probably knew did not meet the quality level they were hoping for as they kept delaying it despite it being finished, they put a big massive shield in front of every episode. Because of people dislike this show because it has queer representation in it, we just need to put a big ass warning in front of the episodes. Because then they can't criticize us anymore because we warned them not to watch it. Either that or they thought telling people this is a mature story for adults would actually make it true. Again, this is all just speculation from me and I have no proof of any kind other than being old and having followed the entertainment industry for over 10 years. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones, phone, right? So what is the biggest problem of this show? More than broken world building, more than badly written characters and more than virtue signaling. In my opinion, the biggest and most glaring problem for High Guardian Spice as a whole, which affects every single avenue of it, is the fact that it's completely lacking in emotional honesty. High Guardian Spice feels like it was written with some mental checklist of things they need to include or targets they have to hit to automatically make it a good show. We need the characters to have an event happen so they can have this specific emotion at this specific point in time because that's how stories work. If we want our characters to be likeable, we have to show them as being relatable but not in any way that could be viewed as actual character flaws. Because if we give them any sort of true flaws, we might be accused of our characters being problematic in some way. And then the teenagers on Twitter will be mad at us because we didn't character correctly. High Guardian Spice feels performative. It feels like it was written in an echo chamber, where a small group of people who all have the exact same mindset, opinions, tastes and friend groups were in a room together and one of them stood up and recited all the right opinions and then got applauded for saying things the group already agreed with. And they just went through this feedback loop over and over, all making sure nobody says or does anything outside of this pre-approved echo chamber. And so when they wrote this show, making sure to only say and do these pre-approved things, they all nodded to each other that, yes, we have said all the objectively correct things in the correct way. Therefore, we have created a brilliant pre-approved, objectively good story. And our audience will bathe us in adoration and accolades because if they are morally in the right, then they must be exactly like us and agree with everything we say by default. But nothing in that way of writing leaves room for any true emotional honesty. Because emotional honesty can be messy or nuanced, or it could simply make you feel far too exposed to the group you have surrounded yourself with, who constantly judge the level of correct all your thoughts and feelings are. But here's the thing, if you truly want to create something, whether it be a story or a painting or a movie or a song or even an outfit, you have to put some vulnerable, honest, exposed part of yourself into it. The thing you make doesn't have to be deep or important, it just has to have something that comes from a true and honest place. Because if you don't, you'll end up with nothing but an emotionless husk, 
constructed with no more honesty or truth to it than a movie written by committee to appeal to the broadest audience possible for maximum profit increase. With no room for anything that might at any point make your audience uncomfortable or feel anything more than the baseline of amusement. Because isn't that exactly what you're doing? Constructing a story by committee from pre-approved concepts slotted into place for maximum positive feedback in the form of internet approval? All the previs action sequences were already assembled before they even had a script in 2017. Or a director. Or a director. Or a writer. Which is a real thing, by the way. You know what show High Guardian Spice reminds me of a lot? I really like Family Guy, not for any one reason, it's just for a bunch of smaller reasons that build up until I just don't find this show entertaining. But one of my criticisms is the fact that the characters are written extremely inconsistently, changing their entire personalities on a whim from episode to episode, but not in a way where you can hand wave it away as a comedy show we're not supposed to take seriously. The characters in Family Guy feel like walking mouthpieces an amalgamation of surface-level flanderized personality quirks who only exist to espout the opinions of the writers on whatever topic they wish to discuss that week. Either that or they morph into straw men to be argued down and proven wrong, suddenly holding opinions that they've never even spoken about before. Quagmire is a sex pervert who constantly assaults and lusts after women regardless of who they're married to, who they're related to, what age they are or how sober they are. But when the writers want him to, he has a monologue about spousal abuse and we're supposed to take him seriously. Meg is most often a literal punchline, aimlessly walking around the show to be beaten up and made fun of for being ugly. But when the writers want her to, she turns into a hateful deluded religious straw man so Brian can soapbox the writers' opinions on organized religion and the merit of atheism. But then at other times, we are to see Meg as a heroic martyr, taking the brunt of her family's abuse to provide them with an outlet and keep the family unit together, which is... Well, <laughs> that's sure an opinion. The characters in Family Guy are not characters. They're frameworks for the writers to indulge their own opinions through, using the show as a soapbox. But even Family Guy has the ability to have rare moments of honest emotion that you can feel comes from a real emotional place, rather than just sermonizing an opinion. What would I do if you weren't here? Hmm? You're the only one who makes my life bearable. You're my only friend, Brian. If I didn't have you, I'd be lost. Uh, you'd be okay. No, I wouldn't. Probably my favorite moment in High Guardian Spice is the very small scene where Snapdragon asks Amaryllis if she'd still like her if she painted her nails too, despite it making no sense in the narrative. I like your nails. Would you still like me if... If I painted my nails? Only if you promise to stick to flattering collars. Be serious. <laughs> <laughs> I am. This is the only scene in the entire show that feels like it came from a place of honesty. It feels like something that was written from a place of experience. When people tell you to write what you know, they don't always mean write things that you've literally been through. I started reading a book a short while ago called Nor Crystal Tears. Now. I don't think Foster has ever been a two and a half meter long bug alien, but when the main character talks about his anxieties as a larva, because what if he comes out of his cocoon wrong? What if he doesn't spin it correctly? What if he leaves his cocoon too early? What if he doesn't do it right and ruins his life? Those are emotions I cannot only understand, but even somehow relate to. And the way they were written, it doesn't come across as the author trying to check off a little box to make sure he did character backstory correctly. It feels like a person who knows and understands and has experienced what puberty and uncertainty and growing up feels like. How terrifying and uncertain it all is, and how you can drive yourself insane, worried you might on some intrinsic level be some sort of failure because you're unable to do something everyone else can do purely by instinct. It's a moment in the main character Ryo's life that's written from a place of emotional integrity. It's not there because the author wants 1982 Twitter to congratulate him on his insect representation. It's there because the author wanted to express the insecurities of growing up. High Guardian Spice doesn't allow its characters to be anything but perfect representations of whatever cause the writers want to white knight and receive praise for. 
being queer, being trans, mental health, girls being strong female characters, etc. But the fact is that it is in the very imperfections that the show refuses to allow that an audience will grow to love a character. To rewind back to their cited inspirations, we don't love Usagi because she's a strong female warrior who says all the right things. We love Usagi because she isn't very smart, she isn't very ladylike, she's way too loud for what Japanese society demands, she's pretty bad as a senshi at first, and sometimes she lets her emotions get the better of her. We love her because she's imperfect, but she does not let her shortcomings stop her from treating everyone around her with love and understanding. We love her because we see her also sometimes fail at doing so, before she pulls herself together and overcomes those moments of weakness. And don't get me wrong, you can make the most sincere, heartful, genuine expression of who you are at your core in your movie or show or what have you, and still be rejected by your audience. There is absolutely no guarantee that just because you were bold enough to put yourself out there that people will automatically love you for it. But you have to try. Even if you end up with the biggest piece of cringe ever seen on the internet. This is ignorance and completely unfair. This country fucking sucks. It just fucking sucks. You still have to try. Otherwise, really, what's the point of being an artist? A couple of months ago, every episode of High Guardian Spice was suddenly put behind Crunchyroll's premium paywall. Some comments on my videos wondered if this was perhaps a funding technique to try and build up a budget for a second season. I thought it was more along the lines of The Warner's films, which made absolutely no sense, were locked away in the studio vault never to be released. However, it seems Crunchyroll is just aggressively locking everything except for exactly 1000 hours of content behind a paywall, including every single one of their originals. So this isn't actually anything to do with High Guardian Spice. It's just Crunchyroll being extremely avant-garde by advocating for piracy, which I will admit is a pretty bold move for a streaming service. Anyway, moving on. When High Guardian Spice had only just been released, Rodriguez would now and then tweet about what he'd like to do in a second season of this show. These tweets consisted of things like teasing Sage and Rosemary as a couple, Snapdragon transitioning to female, and having a character that only speaks Japanese like this is fucking Homestuck or something. I will, however, give Rodriguez endless compliments on the fact that despite the hatred and anger and absolute thrashing the show has gotten and continues to get online, he does continue to stand by it. It would be completely understandable if Rodriguez decides to never talk about High Guardian Spice ever again following the hate it got, but instead he stands by his story. He still draws the characters sometimes, he retweets fan art, he takes full ownership for these characters. And if nothing else, Rodriguez managed to get an entire show off the ground and completed. That's no small feat, especially for a brand new studio with mostly first time creators working on it. And despite the disaster that High Guardian Spice ended up being, it will no doubt continue to open doors for him in the animation industry. But at the same time, tweeting about minute self-indulgent nonsense like ships and the queer identities of the characters and whatever else meaningless fluff, while never once even mentioning Lavender's name, never teasing anything about the plot or which country or any of the actual story of the first season, also sadly indicates that Rodriguez doesn't seem to have learned any real lesson from this show's debacle. Instead, he appears happy to chalk up the extreme hatred as every critic of the show being outed as a bigoted homophobe, and that he and his writers did nothing wrong and they are only hated for reasons outside of their control. And everything else that was bad about the show was due to the show having a very low budget, also something out of Rodriguez's control. Because no show that had a bad budget has ever been good or made any kind of lasting impact. You're supposed to be in jail. Yeah, and you're supposed to be dumpster diving for ham scraps, you six-piece chicken McNobody! Get out of my seat! The reason we say it's important to acknowledge our mistakes is because if we delude ourselves into thinking we've done nothing wrong in a situation, then there will be no reason to change anything we did the next time. Because if we did nothing wrong and it was all just people who hated us for things outside of our control, why on earth should we change anything? 
Rodriguez has openly denied any responsibility for why the show ended up being bad, from blaming a really small budget to blaming the use of a Korean studio instead of acknowledging that every problem in this show was due to mismanagement. However, Rodriguez also claims full responsibility for everything good about this show, claiming in his professional website that he had control over every single aspect of it. So everything that was bad or went wrong wasn't his fault, but everything good was entirely because of him. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. At the end of the day, the fact remains that Rodriguez was given 12 entire 22 minute episodes to create his passion project using his OCs that he has been drawing since college. And he spent those 12 episodes wasting time, neglecting the plot, inserting unplanned character arcs and showing no interest in anything outside of ship baiting and sermonizing. And then ended the wasting runtime with a cliffhanger because he felt a second season was a certainty he was entitled to. Luigi, Mario! Daisy! You gotta come with me, I need your help! And then he went on to tweet about how his loyal fans need a second season to get further development to the things he purposefully didn't feel like developing in the opportunity he was already handed. In the words of Kappa Kaiju, It was given to him! And yet, as much as I dislike this show, and as much as I raise my eyebrow at some of the things Rodriguez has tweeted, and how he's decided to try and navigate the entirety of Twitter kicking the crap out of him, I genuinely want to see the guy go on to do better things. High Guardian Spice is a badly written show with badly written characters from a creator who has no interest in taking responsibility for its condition. But he's a guy still enthusiastic about these characters that the entire internet told him they hate for almost 12 months now. He still consistently tweets about how much he cares about the animation industry, how much he cares about cartoons, how excited he gets about other people's shows getting off the ground and premiering, shows which get the acclaim and love his show did not. And don't get me wrong, I am aware that Twitter is where you wear your business suit and stay on your best behavior, or at least it's supposed to be, but I really want Rodriguez to do better next time. But for that to happen, he needs to be given a second chance. And despite my incessant complaining in this video series, I still want to give him that second chance. Spending so much time with this train wreck of a show does end with me sort of growing a warped attachment to it. I mean, I still really dislike it, but this show does grow on you. Like a fungus, but it still grows on you. I highly doubt High Guardian Spice will see a second season. However, I could be wrong. There have been shows with absolutely horrible first seasons that somehow managed to survive long enough to become beloved pillars of television. But the backlash for High Guardian Spice was so loud and so vitriolic, I don't see Crunchyroll being eager to stoke the flames anytime soon. Perhaps at some point they'll sell the rights to someone else who might decide it's worth bringing back. Perhaps I'm completely wrong and we will see a second season of Crunchyroll gets desperate enough to try and sell memberships. Who knows? But I don't expect to see this show rear its head again anytime soon. Following High Guardian Spice's release, a trend has come up of artists and writers taking the building blocks of this show and reworking it. Doing an image search for High Guardian Spice will show results for just as many character redesigns as actual official images. Some of these range from simple tweaks and adjustments to completely new designs that don't even resemble the originals, to reimaginings using the originals as a springboard. Similarly, writers have taken the thrown away and neglected ideas and plot points and tried to rework them into a more functional narrative, or just rewrote scenes that came across as clunky and awkward into being more natural. And I think this is because, as I've said earlier, this show did have potential, and every now and then you can see the foundations for something worthwhile. It's just impacted by everything else that's badly handled, badly executed, or just plain mean-spirited. 
On the High Guardian Spice Reddit, I saw some people grumble that it's easy to take something that already exists and redesign it, but it's a lot harder to make something from scratch as a way to criticize this trend. And they're right. It is harder to make something from scratch than it is to rework something that already exists. Which is why Rosemary started out as a Madoka Magica ripoff. And then, over time, was slowly changed and reworked and retweaked and redesigned until we ended up on the character she is now. She is by no means even close to resembling Madoka in personality or even looks that much. You may be able to recognize the inspiration, but you can't call her a ripoff. And so I can only see the vast amount of redesigns and rewrites as being positive, even if the people making these never do anything with them again and they remain as nothing more but an artist going, what if I try to fix this? I think that can be enough, because if nothing else, they are the lasting final testament to the fact that somewhere deep, deep, deep in there, this show could have worked. Nobody is making redesigns for the nut shack, is all I'm saying. I want to say thank you to everyone who joined me on this insanely long journey as I gradually lost my mind talking about this show. It's really helped my small channel in many ways. I know there are people who will watch this and only really wanted to hear someone drag High Guardian Spice. So if you decide to say goodbye at the end of this series, I want to say thank you for stopping by. I really mean it. But just do me a favor and throw me a like and maybe a comment so my stuff can show up on other people's recommendations. And to the people who decide to stick around after this, I can only hope to hold your attention as I move forward. I thought I had more I wanted to say in this Oscar acceptance speech at the end here, but I, I think that's actually it. Thanks for hanging out guys, I'll see you in the next one.